about how we've got our preschools around around Singapore, and then we've got our primary schools, and then we've got Orchard, which is our feeder school. So I don't need to talk too much about that, but the thing that I do want to talk about today is what IB means and what an international baccalaureate PYP system is, which is primary years program. Because when you're looking for a school, you'll hear from lots of international schools, they'll be doing IGCSC, they'll be doing the Cambridge International Curriculum. There's schools here that do the Australian curriculum as well, but we've chosen to be an IB school and there's a very, very important reason why. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. I have worked in IB schools for over a decade now, and I found their curriculum approach to be perfect because they're a curriculum approach that's ever changing. And that's the key thing in education because education is about society and the world around us. And our children are growing up in a world that you or I didn't grow up in. And so the IB curriculum approach is one that's ever changing. Every year, they're constantly reviewing what's the best way for our children to learn. So the curriculum approach that I'm going to talk to you about today is IB PYP. And this is probably the best diagram for money that you could ever find when you're talking about the IB. So if you do want to learn more about the IB and you Google it, go to images and look for this icon because this is exactly how they break down the entire curriculum, the approaches to teaching, and every IB school around the world uses this same approach. And that's over, I think it's about up to 7,500 different schools around the world. Um, and PYP schools make up over half of that. Um, so when you look at this, imagine you're looking at a target. And what's the most important thing in a target? It's the thing that's at the center. And so right at the center of our diagram here, you can see the picture of the learner because the learner is always at the center of everything we do. Moving out from that, we have things that aren't less important, but the things that are wrapping up what's important in the middle. So it always comes back to the learner. And up in the corner there, you can see that we're talking about the learner profile. And the learner profile is important to our schools because there's 10 of them. There's 10 attitudes to learning. And no matter what school you go to anywhere in the world, um, every school has a philosophy or they have an approach where they talk about learners. So in Australia, it's things like the essential skills to learning and the role of a lifelong learner. Here, we use the learner profile and it's 10 different attitudes that everything revolves around. And when I say everything, I mean everything in our school. When we talk to parents, we use the IB language for learner profile. We say, oh, we wanna be caring with the children and we wanna communicate with our children as well. And we want them to be thinkers. So all of that language is in our behavior management policies. It's in our policies that we use as leadership. The teachers as well, when we make up our essential agreements about how we're going to work together, we use all the language from the learner profile. So I just wanna knock that one out straight away. Everything keeps coming back to that about the learner and how we're going to encourage the learners to be internationally minded, lifelong learners. Then around the outside of that, we've got approaches to teaching and approaches to learning. And the reason they're important is because this encompasses all the skills of learning, okay? And it breaks down into five simple areas, which is thinking skills, communication, research, self-management skills and social skills. So you can see that the skills that we focus on in an IB school, they're not just things like reading and writing. Those are in the scope and sequence and they're very, very important, but we're looking holistically at the person as a human. So we look at things like social skills and we look at things like self-management skills. And when we're doing a unit of inquiry, which is how we organize our curriculum, and I'll go more in depth about that a little bit later, but when we're doing a unit of inquiry, these skills are all put into there. Now, there's five overall skills, but they're break, broken down into sub-skills. So for example, thinking skills, we come down into things like analyzing and metacognition, which is thinking about thinking, which is a very difficult thing for primary school children to understand. But I can guarantee you, if we went and talked to some of our year six students that go through exhibition and we go, hey, what did you think when you were thinking? What did you think about your thinking? They're able to give responses because that's what they've done the whole way through from N2 all the way up to grade six. This language has been built upon step by step by step through real learning engagements. So that's the second part of the circle is that approaches to teaching and the skills. Then when we come out from that, we've got how do children share their learning? 
And individual sharing of learning is something really important. And it's that third circle out. And you can see there it says agency, action, exhibition. And I'm going to talk about agency and action because exhibition is something that happens at the end of grade six when we're leaving at PYP school. But across our schools, we all do these differently. But agency and action is the really important one. Our belief is that if a child is going to learn something, they need to understand what they can do with it. Um, I don't know about you, but I was always that kid that sat at the back of my maths B class in grade eight going, sir, when am I ever going to use this in the real world? When am I ever going to use what you're teaching me in the real world? I was that sort of kid. And it makes me very conscious and it makes our teachers very conscious that when our kids are learning something, they need to understand, so what? Why am I learning this and what am I going to do about it? And how can I use this to make me a better person and make the world around us a more peaceful place? And that literally comes from the IB mission statement. We want children that take action to make the world a more peaceful place. And later on, we're going to talk about some of the evidence of agency and action that's been happening in our school here and across schools in Eaton House just in the first six weeks of school this year. Um, okay, so, of course, these things are very nice and it's great to have a philosophy about teaching and in this curriculum framework, which is the IB framework, this is the things that are important. The learner profile, approaches to learning, and sharing of learning. But we're a school, we need to have subjects, we need to have subjects with curriculums attached to them. And that's where we get things like learning outcomes. So of course, you know, like science, children need to know how photosynthesis works. Um, when we get to maths, they need to have the skill of being able to partition numbers to understand they're made up of tens and ones. All of those skills come from what we call scope and sequence documents. And Bipasha talked a little bit about them earlier, and about how different schools around the world, they have different curriculums with different scope and sequence documents. Not at Eaton House, not anymore. So across all of the Eaton House schools in Singapore, and hopefully we'll be able to export it to our um, brothers and sisters overseas as well, we've all gotten together and we have made consistent scope and sequence documents that are made and aligned to international benchmarks. So we've used things like the Cambridge International Curriculum, the UK International Curriculum. We've used some of the American uh, for social studies, the National Council of Social Studies. We've also used some of the Singapore curriculum. And what we've done is we've put them all together to make sure that our children, when they do our core subjects like our maths, science, English, and social studies, what they're doing is they're getting an international benchmark of achievement. Okay, and we also do along the way, when we do our assessments, we make sure that they're attached to those international benchmarks, meaning our children, God forbid, if they had to go somewhere else, we don't want them to go, but if they did go anywhere else in the world, they would be up to date and competitive in that educational landscape. Our children that leave our schools here in primary school, going on to Orchard, we know that they've got all the tools necessary, the content, the knowledge as well, to be able to be in that environment and be competitive. So that's why we've got an internationally based scope and sequence. That's what we mean when we talk about curriculum. It's about the subjects. And as you can see in an IB school, and you can see that's about the fourth circle around, these are the core subjects that we have. And across all of our schools, we have these. So you've got language, right? And in our schools, depending on which school you're at, of course, English language is there because English is our medium of instruction across our EIS schools. And then we also have bilingual um, opportunities as well with Mandarin. So we all have bilingual approaches, depending on whether you want your children in bilingual class or whether you've decided that you want them to take it as an additional language. And then some of our schools have additional languages on top of that. We have, for example, at Broderick, we have Japanese and we have Hindi, um, and therefore children that are native speakers so they're still learning their mother tongue and they still get to express themselves through that. We also have English as an additional language for those children that aren't yet able to access the curriculum fully through the language of English. So we also have support programs in place. So that's what we mean by language. Then around the outside, moving across, oh, I'm gonna go clockwise. We've got social studies, um, which is where we learn about life and living and the world around us. We've got mathematics, then we've got the arts, so different schools, their arts programs broken up into different uh, subjects. So for example, here we have visual arts, but then we also have music and we have drama. 
And that comes back to children being able to share their learning. We're getting, giving them the skills to do that. Then science, and then up the top there, you've got physical, social, and personal education. And so our PE, or if you want to call it sports subject, um, our PE is a subject as well. It's got a curriculum that follows through social and emotional development. And all of our schools have well-being programs or something of a well-being program. Um, here and at Thompson, we use something called the Contentment Foundation. And we use the lessons through that to be able to teach our children things about being mindful and having mindfulness, about self-acuity, also about community and personal well-being. So all the way through, our subjects that are chosen in IB schools are subjects that are going to be well-rounded and are going to set our kids up so when they do go to high school, whether it's with us or whether it's with another high school, they've got all the groundwork paved to be, again, competitive in that educational um, setting and also be thinkers for the future. And the last thing that I want to talk about, because it's what I'm going to follow, in, uh, follow on with, is the IB has organized our learning into six different transdisciplinary themes. And what that means, transdisciplinary is our approach to how we teach. So in a homeroom class, which is, you know, like grade three, where the children spend most of their day is with their homeroom teacher. And then we have specialist teachers, they might go off to visual arts, but we're all teaching the same unit of inquiry. So we're trying to have, for example, up the top there, sharing the planet. And sharing the planet's about how we as humans share finite resources on the earth, human resources as well, um, natural resources. And that whole unit of transdisciplinary inquiry might include things from science, social studies, maths will be in there, English language will be in there, some of our other languages will connect to it. And also our specialist lessons will try and connect to that same transdisciplinary theme. I'm gonna show you a little bit of an example with the year ones that have just finished a unit of inquiry um, where they were looking at how we organize ourselves. So these six themes are the way that we organize all the subject learning. Now, there will be, of course, some parts of a curriculum that don't fit neatly into those little boxes. So don't worry, that's why we have those international curriculum scope and sequence documents. So we know that the children aren't missing out on any of the essential knowledge and the essential skills they need. So sometimes we might have maths outcomes from say fractions that don't fit in those transdisciplinary themes, but they're still taught as standalone inquiry lessons. So there's two ways that we teach in school. It's either the unit of inquiry or we have standalone inquiry units and lessons. Um, also, just to let you know, if you've got any questions along the way, by all means, open your microphone and you can ask me a question or there's a little icon to raise your hand and things like that. And I've got Stephanie here. Stephanie's from our PLO. And um, if I don't see that you've asked a question, Stephanie might butt in and in interrupt me because sometimes I get on a roll and it's very hard to knock me off. So um, like I said, I was talking about uh, how we approach learning. So everything we do is through inquiry. And at Eaton House, this is our definition of what inquiry means because you'll go to lots of schools. And if you're currently looking at international schools for your children, a lot of the schools say, oh, we're an inquiry school. Well, inquiry for us means that we have an environment that is open to inquiry. We have stimuli and provocations that make children question and ask things about the world around. And then we give them opportunities to actively think about what they're doing. And that's a key word, actively, actively think. We don't give them set tasks and say, we want you to respond with the answer that we think you should give us. Okay, we do have that because that's very important. And um, up over there on the back of my wall is about the structure of knowledge. And you've got to have a strong base. So of course, in there are those questions that children should be able to recall knowledge and give it back to us. But we're more about getting the children to apply that knowledge and then do something with it. So when we talk about active thinking, it's about having the children having conversations around what they're doing. So inquiry classrooms are a little bit different to traditional classrooms. And inquiry-based schools are very different to traditional schools. Um, I'm going to show you some of the things that you might see if you come through one of our schools. So these are all photos from the last six weeks because I am aware that 
if you're looking at other schools, you'll get glossy brochures and you'll get um, things that they say, oh, well, this was one day a year ago where everybody was on form and we took this. Well, these are all from the last six weeks here at Broderick. And I know I can do this at Thompson. I could talk to Mike at Thompson and he would be able to share same photos with me. I know that Maggie over at Orchard would be able to share the same photos with me. But this is just to show you what you can expect to see at an Eaton House school when you walk into classrooms. So I'm going to go through a few of these lovely photos of our children in action. So one of the things you can expect to see is that we use a lot of concrete materials and hands-on activities. Constructivism is the term, it's the educational term, but basically it means learning through doing. We have the kids up and about and doing things. Very rarely do we want to walk into a classroom where kids are sitting in rows and their heads down in a book and they're finishing off a worksheet. That's not really our approach. Our approach is making sure that we make activities that inspire kids to have conversations. So of course you can see here, there's a couple of different activities going on in the classroom that require the kids to use hands-on activities. And there's one on the corner there that I'm just gonna blow up as well. And I can't make it any bigger, unfortunately, but it's the one up here in the corner, up in the right. And you can see the kids, they've actually made what's called a Venn diagram. And Venn diagrams are made to compare two things. So this is visualizing their thinking. Now, of course, we could have sat at a desk and we could have given them a printout of it, but by the children sitting down and making it big and using the post-it notes, they have to have conversations, they have to move around. And that's what this is all about. It's about active thinking. So when it's active, of course, you're going to see something where they're taking some actions. So moving on, another thing that you'll see in our classrooms is you'll see a lot of collaboration. We encourage children to talk all day. Um, sometimes our classrooms might look like they're a little bit noisy um, and unruly because kids are sitting together and there's a lot of passion in what they're doing, but it's because they're working together and collaboration is very, very important to us because like I said, we go back to that center, that center circle of the learner and the learner profile and a couple of learner profiles that fit with that is they've got to be communicators, they've got to be responsible and they've got to be thinkers. They're three of the learner profiles. Collaboration is very important for that. Um, another thing that you will see when you come into our class, you'll see lots of discussions and conversations and not just discussions with the teacher. Um, we try to make it, uh, we try to make it a little bit of a rule that in one of our EIS classrooms, we should be hearing the teacher much less than the children. And of course, in some lessons, the teacher has to talk and has to give instructions and they're the, the font of knowledge, but we try and push it onto the children so they're sharing their learning with each other. And we've got a very strong uh, ethos that, you know, when one teaches, two learns. So if a child's talking to somebody else and teaching one of their peers about something, they're both learning from it. So discussion's important to us. Now, another thing that is important to us and you'll see in EIS classrooms is, like I said, we're all about that real world learning. So whenever we're talking to the kids and wherever, whenever we're trying to work, we try to make sure that there's some real world learning going on and they're gonna get out into the real world or the real world's going to come to them. Um, I can see I've got a hand up there from, I hate to mispronounce it, I think Farida? Yes. <laughs> Hello, yes, Farida. Hi, hi, Peter. Now, I'm looking at this, um, all these photos and I'm, I'm thinking of my daughter who doesn't know Mandarin. Mm -hmm. So, um, how how are you going to support her in this group discussion in, that is conducted in Mandarin? Because so, I know it's bilingual. Oh well, it depends which it depends which campus you're at. We have mainstream classes that aren't Mandarin bilingual. So we have mainstream classes and then we have bilingual classes. So for example, in grade five, um, grade five has the swordfish and that's a bilingual class. And so they have roughly we try to have about 50-50 bilingual immersion. But if you're in the sharks or if you're in the dolphins, they're mainstream English medium of instruction. So for you, if she's not up to the level where she can converse in Mandarin, the mainstream would be the best option for you. But even if you were in one of the schools that offers the bilingual program completely, there is always that balance of English and Mandarin in the classroom. So there's support there for children. And we differentiate for all of our children because sometimes we get children that are coming from the other end. And yeah. Stephanie and I are just organizing, we've got a child that's come from um, middle of mainland China and they have very little English at the moment. Yeah. So we've got IEAL programs and EAL programs to make sure they're catered for. Yeah. Okay. 
Thank you. No worries, no worries at all. So the next thing that I'll talk about um, is about how kids share their learning because the big thing for us is we wanna make sure that once they're learning in class, once they've gone through all the knowledge and they've worked through the inquiry, that they're doing something with it. And so sharing is a big part of that. We have open school assemblies where each class gets to present what they've been learning. Children get to come to us and say, hey, I've been learning about this last year. We ended up with kids that came to us and said, we've been learning about, did you know about uh, orangutans? And did you know about what's happening to orangutans? They organize school events where dress as an animal day, they raised money, they sponsored uh, animal from Mandai Wildlife. So there's all of these little activities where we give children an opportunity to share their learning. So that's the, that's the key thing is that learner at the middle and what they're sharing. And of course, one thing that we do like to highlight to parents is our ICT and our STEM projects that we've got going on. Now, every school approaches it differently. Um, at our school, we have a year five and year six BYOD program. So they all have their own devices. And of course, we have limits on that about screen time and about responsible use of technology. And we've got IT teachers that help us with that. But our key program is about getting the kids to use it for research, communication, and also creation. So communication is the key. And we get children um, up in the top corner there, uh, the year sixes, they've just made videos about something they wanted to share with the world. And then we've shared it on an internal uh, platform, Google Classroom. So the children get to look at each other's videos. And then that internal platform, we've actually picked some of those videos and shared it on Blooms, which goes out to our whole learning community as well. So again, it keeps coming back to that. I've learned something, but now I want to apply and share it. And speaking of that, um, I've got two examples here about an inquiry approach. And I'm just conscious of the time. So I'm going to talk about our year ones um, because I think a number of the parents that we've got here today might be looking to bring their kid in into the early years. And I do get questions quite a lot from parents that go, well, it's all well and good. And when, when they're in upper primary, yes, they can ask questions and they can share. But what about my kid? They're only four years old. What are they going to be able to do? So I think this is probably a good example to show with you. So the transdisciplinary theme that these guys were working on was who we are, um, and they were looking at communities around them. So diverse communities rely on people working together. And what we do is we go through the inquiry process. So it comes down to five key parts. So, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. The first one is they're tuning in. So when they're tuning in, this is when we're giving them all of that stimuli and that provocation, and we're trying to put them in a situation where they've got to ask questions and they've got to find answers. And then of course that leads us naturally into finding out, which is where we do all of that good gathering of information and all those key research skills. Um, children have to go online, they have to read books, they have to ask a lot of questions because we try to make sure that even from the grade ones, they're getting those primary sources in. So let's have a look, it's, it's fine for me to talk, but let's have a look at some of the things they did. So for the tuning in activities, um, we said to the kids, do you know who is a part of the school community? Because we were talking about communities and they worked through uh, who am I and who's in my life. So they started with their family. And then we said, well, what other sort of communities are you a part of? And so they talked about, well, I'm in a football team. I work, I go to piano, I go to ballet. And so they started to understand that it's about groups of people working together. And we talked about the school. And of course, the simple answer is, oh, well, I'm in a class and this is my community and that's where it ends. But we said, okay, well, let's walk around the school and see who we bump into. So up in the top corners, uh, uh, sorry, on the left-hand side, we walked around. One of the gardeners was sitting down. So the kids had to talk to them and say, can you tell us what you do in the community? How are you part of our school? And this is four-year-olds. So of course they didn't go up and say, you know, can you explain your role in the community? But they said things like, hello, I'm such and such. Who are you? What are you doing? And so they started to learn that around the school, there were lots more people that were part of the school community. And so then they started to build a definition. What's community mean? It means people that are working to help everybody in the, uh, in the world. So they started doing role plays and you've got some kids there doing role plays as do doctors. We had an open day where the kids got to share about their culture and communities that they're part of. Um, so of course, you know, children went home and spoke to the parents and said, 
What's our culture? What are we part of? Are we part of a religion? Um, do we have a nationality? Do we have friends at the condo that I could talk to? And so that was all about that finding out phase and gathering data and bringing all that information and sharing that at school. Then the next phase that we walk, work through in inquiry is sorting it all out. Okay, so they took all of that information, they started sorting it out. And so they did things like they made up their own uh, social circle maps. And that's what that one is on the corner there. The children identified, well, who's in my tight community and in my family? Then who involves my life around the outside? Then around the outside on that. And what's all of their responsibilities? And you're looking at that and going, oh, well, there's not much writing on that. It's because in grade one, in the first term, their writing skills aren't strong enough for them to be able to say, this is my mum and her responsibilities are. So instead, the children got to talk about it. And so we made little videos of them talking. The next thing is going further. And going further is all about answering questions that we've still got. After all of this and finding out and researching, the questions that we've still got, what do we have questions on? And so some of the questions that came up from the grade ones were things like, well, what can I be a part of the community in the future and how am I going to be there? Um, what buildings do they need and what resources? Why are police having a police station? Why don't schools have, uh, one of the questions, was, why don't schools have theme parks like the one over on Sentosa? And so what they had to do is they had to start sitting together and they had to start planning. And so they wrote little diagrams and started to talk about, well, what's conceivable in a school? Like what's, what's possible for our school community? And they made these little organization, they built it with Legos, and then they had to give a presentation and say, here's all the people that are part of this community. Here's all the buildings that the community needs. And they made suggestions about how it could be better. And the little girls over there in the corner were quite interesting because they'd made one about a veterinary surgery and they brought in little toys and done activities on them. But the whole time, the questions kept getting asked. Well, what does a vet do? Why are they important to the community? What would happen if we don't have them? So that's how year ones can work through the inquiry process. Um, that's our key thing about our schools. Our schools are inquiry based. Curriculum's there, international benchmark curriculum. But I wanted to show you all the photos and all of the examples of how our schools are a little bit different to traditional schools, but they're exactly like IB schools that you find around the world. It's just Eaton House, we take a different approach and make sure that we've got international curriculums uh, backing us.